Hey guys, so we are going to do something a little bit different on my tech blog today. We're going to talk about Poi Math. Ah! No, no, don't freak out, don't freak out. Uh, number one, Poi Math is not that hard to learn. Number two, if you learn it, it opens up a lot of conversations in the Poi world to you. So I actually don't think it's a bad idea to learn, and uh, we're going to go through it in the next 10 minutes here. So what we're going to talk about today is the math of roulettes, which are sometimes called trochoids. Uh, more specifically, we talk about epitrochoids and hypotrochoids, which are essentially a synonym for the concept of flowers in poi. Um, it, we're going to go through two components in order to get there. The first is we're going to learn how to write parametric equations. Uh, number two is we're going to play around a little bit with curves. And it turns out that when you put these two components together, it equals poi flowers, or at least it shows you how to graph poi flowers. Yeah? Awesome. Okay, let's dig in then. We're going to start off with a little bit of review from high school uh, geometry, algebra, and probably a little bit of trig. Specifically, here's what happens if we try and graph out an equation based upon our old school way, which is we have a y and an x axis, and I'm going to graph out the simplest equation I can think of, which is y equals x, right? I'm going to make out a table of the different values that come out of this. When x equals negative 1, y has to equal negative 1 too, because y is equal to x. When x is equal to 0, y is also equal to 0. x1, y1, x2, y2, you get the idea. So I'm going to go ahead and graph out the results of this. When I do so, I wind up with this nice line that goes diagonally through the equation. Beautiful, huh? Okay, so let's try this from a different angle, shall we? I'm going to add another variable into this whole situation. And now x is going to equal t, and y is going to equal t. Okay, so when I make up my graph, I'm going to have my y-axis, and I'm going to have my x-axis, right? But where's my t-axis? Well, there isn't one. T is what we call a parameter here because it is a variable that we're not actually directly graphing. If we set T to negative 1, it means that both Y and X also have to equal negative 1. When T equals 0, they both have to equal 0 as well, right? You see how when we set T, it automatically sets both of the other variables? Now, let's go ahead and graph this out. And lo and behold, it's actually the exact same graph that we were just playing with. It just so happens to be that we've expressed it in a different kind of way. So you can think of y equals t and x equals t as the parametric version of y equals x. Yeah? Okay, so let's do something a little bit more complicated with this. Let's have different operations going on on different axes. So let's say x equals t minus 1 and y equals t plus 1. Now we're no longer going to get the same value for x and y if we set t to say negative 1. When t is negative 1, x is going to be equal to negative 2 because negative 2 is equal to negative 1 minus 1, right? And likewise, y for negative 1 is negative 1 plus 1. It, it uh, evens out, right? So let's go through all of our different data points for this particular equation and graph it out and see what we get, yeah? Oops. And it turns out it's not so different from the graph that we started with. It's just moved over a couple spaces, right? Cool. Okay, so this shows us that we can set different parameters on different variables. And more than anything else, a parametric equation is a relationship that two variables share with another variable. Now let's go to curves. This is an equation I'm sure a lot of us remember from high school math class. Y equals sine x. Let's, once again, map out our variables here. I'm going to use radians because, well, they're just easier. Uh, than degrees, that is. So when I say x is equal to pi over 2, which, remember, is equivalent to 90 degrees, uh, y is going to equal 1. You can check this on a calculator if you want. When x is equal to pi, which is 180 degrees, y is equal to 0. When x is equal to 3 pi over 2, which is 270 degrees, y is equal to negative 2. And when x is equal to 2 pi, y is equal to 0. If I graph this out, I wind up with the sine wave, which is a nice repeating curve. Actually, it's a constant curve. It's changing its curve all the time. Now, let's go to a similar function, y equals cosine x, and graph that bad boy out for you. I'm going to go ahead and just fast forward through the process of laying out all these different variables and everything, because I know it's kind of boring. But suffice it to say, I don't get the exact same results for cosine x that I got for sine x. 
The reason being that this is a slightly different approach to graphing out uh, a curve. Namely, this is a curve that winds up being offset a little bit from sine x. That is, it, it's a little bit out of phase. But this is actually a good thing, and I'll show you why. Because when we take both of these ideas and put them together, that is, when we take our parametrics and add them to our curves, we have the opportunity to create much more complex curves. In fact, we create types of curves that are called roulettes. Now, I'm going to take those two equations that I just started with, and I'm going to apply the parametric touch to them. So now, x equals sine t, and y equals cosine t. The result of this is I've just drawn a circle. This is something that mathematicians refer to as a unit circle. The reason being that the radius is 1 in every single direction. Yeah? OK. So let's do something a little bit more complicated and a little bit more close to what Poi does. So I'm going to graph out x equals sine t plus sine t and y equals cosine t plus cosine t. In other words, I'm doubling my values either which way. Now I wind up with a circle that goes two units in every direction. Now that littler circle still remains in there and you could think of that little circle, which is the first couple terms, as the behavior of the hand as we're moving around Poi. The second set is the behavior of the Poi. We just graphed out an extension. So, let's try graphing out something a little bit more complicated, shall we? Now this time, I'm going to graph out x equals sine t plus sine 3t. Ooh, interesting. What about y equals cosine t plus cosine 3t? Notice how I'm repeating the same number before t in both cases? Okay. So when I graph this out, once again, I wind up with that little hand circle in the middle. That bit hasn't changed. But when I graph out the poise section, something has changed. Namely, by adding that 3 in front of t, I have changed the frequency with which it completes a circle, right? So now the poi head is completing three circles for every one circle that the hand is completing. The result is a two-petal inspin flower. But wait, three circles and two petals? Why is this? Well, to be honest with you, the reason is, is that we're counting downbeats here with that number 4t. We are not counting flower petals. No, 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 no. Now we are counting the moments when the poi is pointed down towards the ground. Cool, huh? Okay, so what about anti-spin then? Ah, so glad you asked. Now, let's instead take sine t plus sine negative 3t. Negative? Why negative? Well, because when we're graphing out these kinds of equations, the negative number in front of it is shorthand for turning the opposite direction. Oh, shoot, wait. That's the wrong graph. Sorry, even I mess it up sometimes. Okay, let's try that again. Now, x equals sine t plus sine of negative 3t, y equals cosine t plus cosine of negative 3t. And if we go for three downbeats this time, guess what? We get a four-petal anti-spin flower. So a four-petal anti-spin flower actually has the same number of downbeats, if you count it, as the two-petal in-spin. Ta-da! Awesome. Cool. So thank you guys for watching this. If you enjoyed it, please leave me some comments. And have yourselves a great weekend. Peace.